Hi, everyone. So, I mean, just, just to clarify, I've been an assistant professor for two weeks. So, um, <laughs> new. <laughs> um, so, uh, let me check that this works. Okay, cool. Um, so just, just to get a brief sense of this audience, um, and you can vote for multiple things, how many of you identify as ecologists? Okay. And how many identify as computer scientists? All right, cool. So we have some mix. I tried to sort of get it a bit of both, but um, I thought it might be nice since this is kind of the first keynote um, of, of this workshop um, to try to give sort of a broader picture of where I think the field is at today, this interdisciplinary field, this sort of growing niche um, within machine learning and ecology, and also where I think um, the big open research challenges are and the things that I hope all of us can work on together. Um, so I don't really need to sell this to this audience, but uh, biodiversity is in catastrophic decline. We're seeing um, rates of extinction go up exponentially kind of across the board um, and across the taxonomic tree. And the, the most recent estimate is that we've lost about 69% on average of species population sizes in just a single lifetime. Um, and biodiversity is really intrinsically tied to many of these other factors that are, I think, very important to all of us in this room. Um, things like climate change, public health, food security, and ecosystem services. Um, biodiversity, one of the things that I've been reading a lot about recently is kind of the intersections between biodiversity and carbon cycles. So um, uh, this increased understanding of how bioturbation from small animals is very important from transferring you know, tree carbon, which has cycles of like 100 years, to soil carbon, which has cycles of like 1,000 years. Um, so I think there's still a lot for us <laughs> to understand about how these things are interplaying. Um, but the thing that's challenging for all of us, and the thing that sets this apart from many other applications of machine learning for uh, the sciences, is that there is no direct sensor for biodiversity across taxa and scale. Um, there really is no such thing as like, for example, if you're studying weather, um, you can go and put out temperature sensors and pressure sensors that directly measure the quantities you're interested in. But if you're interested in studying biodiversity, instead we have to use these incredibly diverse proxy sensors, things like images or sound or DNA. Um, and then those proxy sensors, are that proxy data is collected at very large volumes and must be processed. There is no way to sort of get at the information we need to start understanding how these things are interacting without processing that data. And that data processing often requires a very expensive and limited expertise. And so it doesn't scale well. Um, so, and also this data is very diverse, um, and this list is expanding. And uh, Quentin is currently in the process of developing new hardware sensors for like basically adding new things to this list of things that we need machine learning to work for. Um, and this is everything from you know satellite data, it's very broad scales down to um, tracking individual animals um, at over over long periods of time. Um, but like I said, the labels require expertise, and so that means that they're either very expensive or very sparse. This is a picture of, it's a little bit old, but 43 million camera trap records taken across the globe that are in Wildlife Insights. I help out, sort of consult with their AI team. Um, and out of the 40 million camera trap images that were at this point in Wildlife Insights, only about half of those have human labels. Um, and this is actually an, an interesting thing because this is actually a biased sample. The people who are putting their data in Wildlife Insights are often people who have labeled the data. So the real number in terms of how much unlabeled camera trap data is out there on Earth uh, is probably much higher. Um, and then most of those human labels are actually not expert verified. Um, I don't know how many of you in this room maybe work with camera trap images. I know Magali does. <laughs> um, so often when we're scaling up and we're trying to label all the data coming from a camera trap, this is just one example of a type of data that ecologists might study. Uh, we're doing that with undergraduates or with volunteers, and those people often are not necessarily experts. They're learning on the job. Um, and rough rule of thumb, when I get camera trap data sets from ecologists and they tell me that they are labeled, you know, uh, correctly labeled, uh, when we actually start to go through and dig into that data, 
my estimate is that usually we're somewhere between five and 10% in accurate labels um, from human labelers. Uh, so, you know, humans are not perfect. And so we need to kind of set our expectations appropriately for machine learning as well. Um, and then, you know, even in these like labeled data sets, so even if we say, oh, okay, this data set has mountain lions in it, there's actually a ton of bycatch. There's unextracted information that we're missing because we just don't have the capacity to process it. Every single plant in the background of this image, the health of those plants, what the rates they're growing at, um, all of these are things that we could extract from these images if we had the capacity. Um, so we need automation to help us scale. And I think all of us are here because we agree with that, right? We need to automate these processes so that we can make more of what we already have um, in order to kind of really expand our, our information. So AI has started to be successful in ecology in many different ways. Um, and here successful, um, maybe I'm defining as useful <laughs> because I think that there's many different ways that you can define AI success. One of those might be um, I published a paper in a machine learning journal that doesn't always translate to it being useful. Um, but the, the, what I consider to be successful AI systems in ecology tend to share a few common themes. Um, so one of those is that they're starting and they're being trained on diverse and standardized data with clean labels. Um, and actually, one of the best ways to improve your machine learning model is either diversify your data or go in and clean up all those incorrect labels. Because if you're training a model from data that's labeled in a confusing way, you're basically forcing the model to draw classification boundaries that are actually don't make any sense. Um, so uh, a good example of this is, I don't know if any of you have tried Merlin Sound ID. Um, so this is developed by a, a good friend of mine, Grant Van Horn. We were in the same lab at Caltech. Um, the way that they got that model to be good was cleaning up the training data. There's nothing special about the machine learning at all but they built a really, really intelligent system to help this sparse set of experts efficiently clean up inaccurately labeled training data, and that got them to the very high precision that you see in that app, which is, I think, really remarkable. Um, the next thing is starting from the best possible pre-trained models. So, you know, not really starting from scratch. We're almost always operating in the space of small data sets, so this doesn't necessarily apply if you are operating at the Wildlife Insight scale where you have 40 million images, but many of us don't. Um, so starting from good pre-trained weights, making use of what's already out there. Um, the third thing is, and I think maybe one of the most important things and something that's not captured at all um, from a benchmark data set alone, is closed feedback loops and iteration. So uh, a lot of these systems that have gotten to be very useful have gotten to be useful because they've built a model. They have deployed that model to users who need it. The users have found places where the model doesn't work, provided that labeled <laughs> data back to the AI experts, they've retrained the model, and this iteration happens continuously. We're now on version five of the mega detector, for example, it's like one example of a useful model. And every single iteration that we've put out has increasingly solved these problems. And the idea that you can build a perfect model that never needs to change from day one when the world is changing constantly underneath you, I think um, is a naive one. And finally, most of these successful AI systems just ignore the long tail. Um, they do not try to predict rare species. They just don't do it because it's really hard. Predicting accurately from very, very limited training data is something that AI is not currently reasonably capable of. And people will publish tons of methods that say, look, my method is doing so much better on the long tail, but better is going from 5% to 14% accuracy. It's still very far from being useful. Um, so I think there's this other really important point that is picking what you want the model to do intelligently and figuring out this trade-off between automated labeling and human labeling. How do you direct human attention to the things that you know your model will not do well? Um, and so really, that kind of gets at what's still very hard. So these are the things that AI cannot do right now. Um, we are very, very bad at the long tail and we're very, very bad at distribution shift. Um, so the long tail here, what I mean, so this is just, this is an example this is from years ago when iNaturalist only had 16 million images and now it's up to like 150 million plus. Um, but for those first 16 million images on iNaturalist, if you plot the, dis, the sort of number of examples per species, and this is note like log log scale, so quite, um, there's quite a big difference in terms of the ticks. Um, what 
we can reasonably do well, you need uh, something like a thousand. That, that number's maybe creeping down towards a hundred now. Um, diverse representative examples of your species of interest to be able to do a good job. Diverse and representative are an important point here. A hundred examples that are highly spatiotemporally correlated doesn't actually count. It might be counted as one example. Um, it takes, if it takes us that much, there's still like an order of magnitude of species that we cannot accurately predict. Um, and humans are able to learn pretty well with something like three to seven examples Though there's, there's, there's a bit of a misnomer because often we're not only shown images, we're shown images and provided explanations. Um, so uh, you know, human brains are a bit more complex. But I think what is definitely true is that there's a big gap between what we can do as humans and what machine learning models can do in terms of efficiency of learning, learning from a few examples and doing a good job of identifying that thing in the future. Um, but machine learning gives us the scale. I definitely can't recognize 10,000 species. <laughs> I can recognize maybe like I don't know, 10. <laughs> and then uh, the other really big thing is distribution shift. Uh, these models are basically maximizing likelihood. Um, in the end, like they're, they're, just, they're just statistical models. And uh, if you're maximizing likelihood over a distribution and then that distribution changes, your performance degrades. Um, and I'll get into that a bit more later because the different dimensions of how um, those distributions shift. But what is definitely true is the only constant in the world is change. And so we need to build models that can adapt to change and be flexible and sort of understand when they are starting to degrade or when things are getting wrong um, so that we understand dimensions of change. Um, and I think one of the things that maybe scares me the most is if we're actually trying to use these machine learning models to understand how the world is changing, but as the world is changing, our model performance is changing, how do we disentangle the real signal from just model performance change? I think that's one of the biggest open questions that we all need to work on. Um, and so, you know, why is the long tail hard? I actually don't think it's just the fact that it's a long tail. I think the reason it's hard for us and harder for us than maybe in other fields is because we have things that are fine-grained, highly visually similar. So if you have two species that are highly visually similar, so they look that's difficult for humans to do without training. And then one of them is very common and the other one is very rare. Your model is always going to predict the common species. It just is. Um, and, you know, there are things that we can do <laughs> to get a little smarter about what we're asking models to do. So I think often when we're in these spaces of like, ah, okay, like these things look really similar and the model is struggling to disambiguate, um, Humans are often using different signals to identify things. And this isn't always true, but often there might be another modality of data that has a much more disambigu disambiguated classification signal. So here, visually, American crows and common ravens look very similar. But in the audio space, their calls are very different. Um, so are we using the right data sensor to do classification <coughs> for these different things? Or should we be combining across sensors? And this is some work. Um, there's a really great data set for exploring this audiovisual categorization um, that was also put up by Grant Van Horn um, about a year ago. Um, and similarly, um, you know, getting into this space of when can we use other types of signals, temporal signal, audio signal, um, and also expand beyond just species classification and start to understand things like behavior. Um, there's also been you know, efforts, this was led by Jun Chen um, at KAUST, um, to try to scale up and build data sets that let us start to explore what can be done beyond just images. This is a data set of, of um, basically videos of mammals um, and there's uh, sort of different tasks that are, are sort of possible through this data set. Um, classification, behavior recognition, behavior detection, and this taxonomy grounded animal annotation. So it was uh, annotated with expertise um, from the ecology community. Um, and the categories were actually defined based on ecological importance. Um, so then the other big challenge I talked about that I, unfortunately we just still have not solved this at all, is that ecological data is just not IID. It's not independently and identically distributed. Um, and it's not IID spatially, temporally, or taxonomically. Um, and so this is just, I like this figure because it actually character characterizes not just like the dimension of challenges is like the underlying systems are changing, 
but also just where we collect data is highly biased. So this is a, an estimate of alpha diversity. Um, you can see that most of the diversity on Earth is coming from the subequatorial tropics. This is a heat map of species occurrence data in GBIF, and you can see they're almost anti-correlated. Um, so not only is the data we're actually learning to predict from highly biased, spatially, temporally, or taxonomically, it's also anti-correlated with maybe the signals we want to actually capture. Um, and these performance drop-offs due to distribution shift, this is not an ecology problem. This is a real-world machine learning problem across the board. Um, so this was another benchmark I worked on with a huge list of amazing <coughs> um, co-authors where we were trying to basically move the machine learning community away from studying distribution shift in these like highly curated kind of fake ways. Um, I'm going to take MNIST like digits and I'm going to rotate them and then I'm going to see if the model can still learn to recognize the digits when they've been rotated. That's one very, very, very simple dimension of distribution shift. Um, but actually in the real world, distribution shift can be incredibly complex. Um, and we're dealing with multiple types of distribution shift, both subpopulation shift, um, the, the categories of interest are changing over place and time, uh, sort of how many of each category there are, um, and what we term visual shift. Things actually look different in different places. Um, I've been working recently on trees. Trees grow differently in different parts of the world. You actually explicitly have um, visual differences that mean that if you've trained a model in one place, it doesn't always generalize to another. Um, oh. um, Moritz, there's some, something going on with the recording and it won't let me change my slides. Sorry guys. I don't know. Maybe here. Okay, let's see if it'll work. There we go. That's fine. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, no worries. Sorry, guys. Um, so one of the things that um, we've been moving towards as a community is then trying to think a little bit more carefully about how we actually evaluate um, machine learning models. Um, so if there is one thing that all of you can take away from this week, it is you would better not be randomly splitting your data and getting a model and saying my model is 99% accurate on like a very fixed and randomly split data set and then publishing that. I don't wanna see another publication that has a random split in ecology because it is always wrong. Because we are never going, we're almost never going to use these data. Like we're not gonna use the models on data we've already labeled, right? We're gonna use them on data we haven't labeled. Um, and so then how do you actually want to use it? Well, one thing, might be, um, this is camera traps. It, so these models can overfit to specific camera locations. They do a great job of it. Um, so if you are training your model on some set of camera locations, a reasonable thing, if your goal is to build a model that works for your camera traps, these exact same locations next year, is to think about temporally splitting your data. Train on three seasons of data, test on a held out season, because that's much more representative of how the model will perform in practice. How do you actually want to use the model you've built? If you want to use, build a model that other people can use on other camera traps, then you need to test out of distribution. You need to actually hold out some of those camera locations. Now, the other really important thing is that any results you get on this test data set or that test data set are not generalizable to other test data sets. They're just giving you a sense of roughly what it might your expected performance be, but actually the most important thing is quality control. Every single time you're gonna try and use a model somewhere new, you need to test it. You need to test it in some sort of principled way. I mean, you need to understand, try to get an understanding of how the, the uncertainty in the model might change. Um, what are some of the biases that might be coming into play? And so I think one of the biggest things from the ecology standpoint is thinking very carefully about how we're training models, what we're evaluating them on, and what reasonable claims can we make about that model? What can we claim it can do? And what can we you know, honestly expect it to do well at going forward? Um, and you know, <laughs> when you actually test going out of distribution, we really find that that performance degradation is, is significant, right? Um, we're talking sometimes 20% decrease in performance moving out of distribution, really across the board. So this is a, it's a big challenge. Um, 
And we find that um, even if you have really common species, like even if you have, like, let's say, tons of training data, you still get performance degradation, though it might be smaller in overall magnitude. So this is um, looking at in-distribution versus outer distribution um, camera traps, uh, species classification. Here, these are just best fit lines through the number of training examples for a given species of interest. Blue is the cameras that were seen during training, now held out in time. Red is cameras that were not seen during training. And you can see that there's this consistent gap going from in to out of distribution performance, even when you have, you know, 1,000, 10,000 examples. Um, and so one of the reasons that this happens is uh, the class distribution is different for every static sensor location. And honestly, this is an interesting one because that also means that in your training data, the class distribution is different for each training location. And I think what ends up happening is the model starts to implicitly learn likelihood given a specific background. They start to learn kind of a prior based on specific backgrounds of what you're likely to see. But then this is one of the reasons that you can actually see degradation over time because if you have like a big migration change or if there's some catastrophic event like fire and then the regeneration ends up with a completely different distribution of species or something that's not quite the same as before, these are dimensions of change. And these are dimensions <coughs> of change that you guys in this room understand much better than a computer scientist does. So you can use your knowledge to try to think about how might this model fail? What are the ways that this thing might start to work less well? Um, and you can really see that every single sensor, even if they're in similar places, has a very different distribution over the category set. And we also have visual shifts. So these are temporal or seasonal changes. Um, things, like I said, a catastrophic event. <laughs> this is a nice example of something that didn't change much. Um, here's a coyote. Over the course of a few days, there was a massive wildfire. And a couple days later, the coyote is right back. Um, and these visual differences can be a bunch of different things. Um, different sensor types, so this is like white flash versus IR flash at night, um, different orientations of the camera. These are all things that end up being challenging for models to overcome. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, this CV for Ecology Summer School that I run um, that Magali took part in later today. Um, but we had two different cases at the summer school where they found that their models were memorizing sensor specific or, or um, yeah, like sensor specific characteristics, like the white balance for nighttime images for a given sensor was different than another. And so the model was learning to predict based on that versus something else. Um, a very famous computer scientist uh, basically, um, David Forsyth, he's, he's in the UK. Um, he once said to me, like, you just expect the model to cheat, and then you try to figure out how it cheated. And I think that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> um, and then the, we have this very high visual similarity in data from a single static sensor, right? These are taken a month apart. Um, so you can see how you can start thinking that these models themselves are maybe not as, um, they're not learning what you want them to learn necessarily. They're not learning what a deer is overall. They might be learning what a deer looks like in a specific place in time. Um, and sort of an aside, um, there's a dimension of sample efficiency there. So this is really interesting. If you subsample the data in a camera trap data set by 50% or even down to a quarter, the performance out of distribution changes very little. So that really is just a, a good way to, to realize that every single image is not as valuable <laughs> as you might want it to be, right? Because there's this sample inefficiency. The things look quite similar. Um, so when we're talking about number of examples per class, we actually maybe should be thinking about diversity of examples per class. Um, and different ecosystems have both subpopulation and visual shift. So Ben Weinstein, um, one of the things that he's done that I think is amazing is um, do look at individual tree crown detection across all of the different neon, neon sites, and you can see that you don't, you don't only have visual differences across these different ecosystems. There's also differences in species distribution and density. Um, similarly, if you're, this is a project we've been working on, detecting and counting salmon um, in static sonar. Different rivers have like, notably different background signals and notably different densities of fish and species of fish. Um, and if you're trying to detect and categorize birdsong in something like a static bioacoustic sensor, so you end up with, again, very, very different 
um, background signal. I wonder if this will let me actually play these. Mm, maybe. Eh, don't worry about it. They sound very different, <laughs> is the point. Um, and so again, just thinking about maybe how, how might these models be overfitting to something we don't want them to overfit to. Um, but the flip side of that is also, when is that overfitting useful? And when is it actually something we might want the model to maximize? Um, the one use case where I will reasonably allow people to do random data splitting is if you have 10 million images that were taken in a single season from a set of 100 cameras, and you've labeled 1,000 of them, you want to train a model to try to iteratively label the rest of the 10 million, now you're in an in-distribution scenario. You have data that you can randomly sample across the distribution of what your expected thing is. So the only reasonable way to do random splitting is if you're actually completely in distribution. You're just trying to use a model to label data you already have in hand for your own problem, and you're going to build your own custom model for that data. That is a very reasonable way to do this. So if you actually had data from both of these in hand, you might as well train a model that does somewhat overfit to these background signals because it's useful information for the model if you don't need it to generalize. Um, and also the sampling bias is not uniform across taxa. Um, so just looking at camera traps, right? Like the detection rates vary per species based on both size and temperature. Um, these things are IR based. So something that's cold blooded is, is sort of innately undersampled and things that are small are also innately undersampled. And this is true for basically every type of sensor we have. They're all biased somehow. Audio sensors pick up loud things. Um, satellite sensors can pick up really big things like whales and elephants, but they're not going to do much for frogs. Um, and this type of heterogeneous sampling that we see, where the different sensors that we're using to study biodiversity are capturing data with different distributions spatially, temporally, different resolutions. Um, this means that it's it's difficult to understand sort of what is the best option, like what should we be doing if we want to get sort of the best possible prediction of a given ecosystem. Um, but also, it really then begs the question of how do we make better use of the data we already have across these different modalities? Um, so that's something I've been really interested in my own research recently is, you know, how do we, how do we make use of data that we already have on hand? Um, and I've been studying this in the easy <laughs> case Oh, it's not that easy, but the easy case of trees, because they don't move, right? <laughs> you at least have like consistency in position. <laughs> Dude, easier. At least they don't move. I picked this problem because I was like, okay, at least I know the trees aren't going to move. They might die. <laughs> they might grow. Um, but uh, so we've been studying urban forests, 23 cities, about 344 different genera. Um, and actually now this is scaled up quite a bit internally at Google. Um, and this is an interesting thing. Models trained on the full data set often outperform city or region-specific models, but not always. So people often think like, oh, more data is better, more diverse data is better. Well, it turns out if you're the city of Los Angeles, not really. Training just on all Los Angeles is about the same as training on millions more images from all over the world. So we have a lot to understand still about what is better. Um, when do you actually want to train on more data? When is it actually just the best possible thing to have a specialized model. These are things we, I think we still don't understand as a community. Um, but one thing that seems quite clear is that there's pretty consistent signals between uh, generalizability, so if you train on one city and you're evaluating on another, and the similarity in distribution between those two cities, subpopulation distribution in this case. Um, you can see there's, there's quite notable sort of regional blocks that, that start to appear. Um, so this seems to, per to point to that if you have a good understanding of what the likely distribution of species is in a new place, then you might actually be able to understand how reasonable it might be to ask a model that was trained in a different place to generalize to that place just based on the distributional similarity between the two. And again, another interesting thing is that not all data is created equal. So we're building these models using a combination of aerial data and street level data. And it turns out that the street level data is much more valuable than the aerial data for identifying tree species. So the aerial data alone, our accuracies are, these are um, class average accuracies. So we're asking it to predict really rare species, basically 0% accurate for all the rare species. 
that brings the, the, the metrics down quite a bit. Um, but like aerial accuracy is around 20%. Um, just that one single street view image of the species, that doubles. Adding additional street view images gives you a little bit more, and then combining them gives you like a tiny bit more in these average metrics. But what we do find is actually there are some species where adding the aerial data does seem to improve conformance a lot more. And we're combining these using a really simple mixture of experts model. And you can look at the, the weights learned by that mixture of experts model. Um, they're actually the best performance is when you let those mixture of experts weights be regional. Um, so you basically don't learn one expert mixture of experts, you learn regional ones. And what we do find is there's kind of these like special cases where the model learns to trust the aerial data more, even when there's not that many examples of that species. And this, it kind of makes sense. It's things like palm trees, where often from these ground level views, you just see what looks like a telephone pole. It's very difficult to identify them. So not all data is created equal. And I also think that we can't ignore the massive developments going on right now in AI. We can't ignore sort of modern AI when we're doing this. We don't want to hamstring ourselves. Um, so one of the things we've been using is this off-the-shelf segment anything model as an initial signal. Um, I've now been exploring sort of 3D instance like segmentation across these street level and aerial views, and we use SAM. Um, you can sometimes get what we call expensive annotations for cheap. And then if you don't need them to be very accurate, it's just sort of a rough, weak starting signal. This, is, this can be really valuable. Mega detector, which is a camera trap animal detection model, might fall into this thing. Expensive annotations for cheap. Less human effort to get better annotated data. There is a lot of interest right now in trying to figure out how to generate additional training data for rare species or generate training data out of distribution for, for different species. Um, be careful. I think this is a very interesting line of research, but I just think be careful. Make sure you have evaluated your models very, very carefully. And the next thing is, is these vision language models. There's increased interest in, you know, how do we build things that are queryable? Like you have, you know, 150 million images on a naturalist. Can you as an ecologist just ask a question? Find me every image of a raptor on a telephone pole in INAT because I, there's an ecological question I'd like to answer. Like, this is something that should be possible with vision language models. But again, this really sort of gets at this issue we have where those language models and the vision models that are trained on, you know, the whole internet don't often understand fine-grained classes very well. So what can you ask these models to do now and what can't you? Um, there was one of the um, computer vision for ecology summer school projects was trying to detect kelp in the background of images of fish in iNaturalist. And this is like, yeah, we could get a much better sense of kelp distribution. Um, we can really increase the number of occurrence records we have. But again, what biases might there be incurring? I don't know. Um, and then, you know, things like self-supervision can enable global representations, but they're very expensive. Um, so this is uh, some pretty awesome work that was done um, by uh, Hannah Kerner and David Rolnick, our two other sort of young PIs in this space, um, where they were looking at taking a bunch of different remote sensing data um, and then training masked autoencoders using sort of real world relevant masking strategies to build very lightweight representations um, that then could be characterized reasonably, so a, a nice starting point. Um, if you're looking at remote sensing data. Um, but this is expensive to train. And um, I'll get into it a bit later today, but I do think that access to compute is a big limiting factor for a lot of ecologists. Um, but then say you have one of those big you know, representation models, how do you kind of efficiently specialize? Um, I think this is another really big open question we should look at. Um, we often don't need a model that will work for everything on the internet, right? We need a model that will work for disambiguating just like shark species. Um, so how do, you, how do you get an efficient model that's cheap to run, that's specialized um, to actually just your area of interest? Um, and so this is some work that we've, uh, that's, we've just recently put on archive, um, but where we're actually taking unlabeled calibration sets and going from large generalist models to sparse specialist models. This is particularly interesting if you actually want to run these models on the edge, or you want to run them over very large sets of data and you don't have a lot of compute. Um, and then there's also a lot of value in 
spatial representations of species. This is recent work from Eli Cole, um, uh, who also was in my, the same lab with me at Caltech, um, where they're, they basically proposed one of the most systematically evaluated um, data sets for looking at species ranges, um, where they evaluate on like a really diverse set of downstream tasks. Um, including some presence only and some presence absence data. I love this paper. You guys should all take a, take a look at it. Um, but uh, really, I think this is very interesting from the computer vision perspective. If you have a good model of where species are likely to be and you know what category is likely to be there, then you can combine that with any, any sort of general species model on the image side and get that, again, kind of specialized model, but now it's specialized to a time and place, um, using just like a simple Bayesian step, essentially, just remapping the likelihoods. Um, and this is, I think, maybe, again, one of the really interesting dimensions. Imperfect models can be useful. Like, how good is good enough for your problem? And what do you actually need it to do? Because if you want to label all the data perfectly, um, that might actually be orthogonal to your end goal, which might be something like understanding species um, occupancy. Um, there was a recent paper that showed that using human labeled data versus using machine learning labeled data that was like maybe 90% accurate on average, um, they got the exact same or very, very similar occupancy maps. So maybe we should be thinking more carefully about evaluating on our actual goal versus trying to maximize for perfect labeling when that extra 5, 10% accuracy might take 100, 1,000% more effort on our side. Um, so just thinking about using human, humans as part of these systems effectively. Uh, this is a model that where we're sort of slowly over time incorporating more and more computer vision for identifying individual elephants, but we built it based on a participatory approach where humans are in the process for ident elephant identification at every step, and now we're just decreasing the human effort over time. Um, and some tasks are easier than others. So what do you actually need the model to do, and can you change that a bit? Um, contrastive tasks are actually often a lot easier for a human um, than identification tasks. So are these the same species of bird, or are these the same individual turtle? Is something that even non-experts can reasonably do quite easily. Um, whereas, who is this turtle <laughs> is a very hard problem. Um, and then similarly, like, you know, drawing these like very accurate contour boundaries, that might be something that takes some amount of expertise, or it might not. Um, it just might take time. And so thinking about leveraging expertise versus um, sort of non-expertise, but enthusiastic volunteers, which we have in this field, um, I think is, is really worth the time. And uh, this, this sort of, uh, this is like a Zooniverse extension of that elephant book project um, that a student from the University of Minnesota has been undertaking to try to figure out how we can kind of expand our ability to do these hard tasks with non-experts. Um, and this is a video that won't play. We couldn't get it to load. But it's, it's just, it's just mega detector detecting stuff. Um, task granularity versus generalizability is a huge thing. The model will often do much better on easier problems. Is there a part of your problem that's easy where you might expect the model to be able to do well? And building intuition about what we can expect models to do. Finding animals and images, it turns out, is an easy problem. Not always, but it's something that we can get to generalize well even to species or ecosystems that have never been seen before. Identifying the species of those animals is still hard, particularly for rare species. So can you? Build machine learning models that do easy stuff at scale, and then can you do the hard stuff as a human while we're in this transition phase? Instead of spending a ton of effort and years of your time trying to get the machine learning model to do everything, which is actually maybe not getting you closer to answering your ecological question. Um, and this is just a fun example uh, from Sarah Basing where there was 170,787 pictures of blowing grass and clouds from one camera trap and mega detector found her the one bird that was in there. Didn't tell her what species it was, but she didn't have to look through 170,000 images. Um, so what's next? Um, I think we need to think about anomaly and change detection, particularly in 
in terms of disambiguating what are ecological anomalies and what are machine learning anomalies. Um, we need to think about bycatch, making more use of the data we already have. Uh, thinking about this interactive specialization. How do you take these modern deep learning models, these vision language models that have been trained for on the order of millions of dollars by large companies and specialize them effectively to make them useful for us in this community? Because we're never going to be able to train models at that scale. We just don't have the resources that they have. Um, and we also need to think a lot about efficiency. Efficiency during training and efficiency during evaluation. Um, because bigger models doing better, sometimes they're only 2% better. And so is it really worth it? I think it's, it's important to think about what's worth it for us in this, in this sort of community. Um, I know this got called out before, but we have an AI for Conservation Slack channel. It's got more than 1,000 researchers worldwide. It's, it's a growing community and a really great one, and so I would very much recommend you all uh, join the Slack and um, you know, take part in these ongoing discussions.